Welcome. <clears throat> this is presentation number 18 in our series, Rereading the Fourth Gospel, the story of Jesus the Revealer. And <clears throat> we are in the home stretch. And the topic today is eschatology, the teaching of the end of times, the end of history. And my title is I go to prepare a place. That is a straight quotation from John chapter 14 and verse 2. And <coughs> let's read it. I go to prepare a place, <coughs> eschatology, in the fourth gospel. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many staying places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. I have translated a word, <coughs> monai, uh, as staying places. It could be dwelling places. I will explain it uh, a little <coughs> later why we do that. But this text seems to say some, some things rather clearly. Jesus will go away. He will come again to take the waiting believer to where he is. And most likely he is in heaven. That is not said explicitly, that is implied. And this is how this text is usually read. But not by everyone. It isn't as straightforward as this might seem. But that is a point of departure we have here. And the occasion here is the farewell time where Jesus, uh, after the foot washing, this is right after the foot washing, and uh, into that long evening, as it were, before Jesus the next day will die on the cross. <clears throat> We're going to go back to the beginning, to the original uh, meeting, to, the, to chapter 1, and pick up our, our storyline there. Uh, this is a majestic <coughs> painting uh, here in the desert. We have John the Baptist, he is preaching in the wilderness and he has some disciples here and he is pointing out to them this figure here, the Jesus, and saying on day two in our story, behold or look the Lamb of God and the next day he repeats it uh, and two <coughs> disciples will follow or he says again look the Lamb of God and that day <coughs> two disciples follow <coughs> after Jesus when Jesus turned and saw them following he said to them what are you looking for they said to him rabbi where are you staying pu menes <coughs> they came and saw where he was staying pu mene and they stayed with him that day. This is quite literal, but it isn't quite as simple in the Gospel of John because <coughs> we read a verse in the beginning about staying places. And here we have the word to stay and we need to explore the vocabulary here before we move on. A place to stay. This is the verb. And the Gospel of John loves this verb. It just has it all over the place. It's just like a carpet almost. And <coughs> the word <coughs> verb is meno, to stay is a primary meaning, but there are extended meanings like remain, continue, persist, abide. <coughs> but the basic, literal, sort of, most sort of tangible meaning, meaning is to stay. And then twice in the Gospel, we have a noun that is related to the verb, monet. 
I have translated it staying place because I do not want to lose the connection between the verb and the noun. It is easy to do that and many translators do it and I think that is a, a, a Ill, Ill advised. <coughs> so Monet staying place in order to preserve the connection to stay and then extended meanings here dwelling place abode mansion state of remaining mansion <coughs> the King James version in my father's house are many mansions but that is a little bit removed from the verb menno so I have toned it down staying place <coughs> then we know where we are <coughs> so let's do the basic meaning again acknowledging that there will be different levels of meaning using this this wor these uh, words <coughs> where are you staying they came and saw where he was staying and stayed with him that day it is as straightforward as can be and here he is in Samaria and has talked to the woman at the well <coughs> and again so when the Samaritans came to him they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days again straightforward and we can see that this verb occurs <coughs> now quite a few times and then the plot thickens <coughs> because later <coughs> we will see another level of meaning with this word as the key word if you stay in my word you are truly my disciples that is a different way of staying and here the NRSV will not use the word stay, they will say continue. And that is fine, but it loses <coughs> the sort of sense of, of the, sort of the thread, the line of thought in, in Greek is in some ways diluted by changing it. It makes maybe better English, <coughs> but it throws us off a little. <coughs> Here again, this is in, that was in chapter 8, here is in chapter 15. Stay, stay in me as I in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it stays in the vine, neither can you unless you stay in me. And here the NRSV will use abide, abide in me. But stay in me is not much weaker than abide. And it keeps the sort of living space connotation uh, alive here. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Stay in my love. So this is a different uh, <coughs> meaning. You would agree that there is a basic, literal level of meaning here. And then there is a, an extended meaning, metaphor symbol and it is an important word again in that sense <coughs> let's look at the noun <coughs> uh, the mene as a <coughs> as a uh, dwelling place so here we read this again uh, already we'll read it again do not <coughs> let your hearts be troubled believe in god believe also in me in my father's house there are many staying places monai and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. And <coughs> this word here is only used twice. And here is the other place. <coughs> Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our staying place with them. So, same word, the staying place word, but here, I will come again and take you to myself, <coughs> so that where I am, there you may be also. Suggesting movement from where he is to where we are, taking us to where he is, back to where he is. But here is a little, little different sense of movement. We will come to them and make our staying place with them period. So that we could say, well, that's a spiritual sense. We'll see. 
we'll we'll uh, have ma we have much work to do before we get these things <coughs> uh, straight. So <coughs> let's do the, do the uh, uh, accounting here <coughs> the, in the literal sense: stay and staying place. That's in the sense of a physical place to stay, whether or on earth or in heaven. And the terms convey space, exteriority, and distance. To stay somewhere. That's location, locating it somewhere. But then we have the symbolic. Some people would say spiritual. But I don't like to contrast literal and spiritual. <laughs> there is plenty of spirituality in literal meanings. So let's not do that one. <coughs> let's do symbolic. Symbolic is, is a fine word. Stay and staying place as presence, focus, restfulness, permanence. That works. And these terms in the symbolic sense convey inner space, interiority an intimacy, to stay in someone. That's a different conception completely, to stay somewhere. We talk about that all the time, that is in everyday language. To stay in somebody, person, <laughs> that is different, indwelling. How do you do that? Well, the Gospel of John does that in a big way, and that has been a confounder when we get to this book's eschatology. So <clears throat> we will do a walkthrough now for some of the terms that are relevant to our sense of how uh, <coughs> John or how this gospel construes the world, present, future, here, there. <coughs> Let's read. So here Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in chapter 3. He comes at night and they sit there talking. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Above. <coughs> Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? So they are like ships passing each other in the night. Jesus is talking about something, <coughs> a, a, a kind of above-below <coughs> contrast, and Nicodemus hears the word in a different way. The word is anothen. Anothen. Oh, and that can be an extension from a source that is above, from above, or it can be a subsequent point in time. So that involves repetition, that something happens again. So both are using correct interpretations, correct uses of anothen, but not in the same meaning. Jesus is talking about birth from above, uh, and <coughs> Nicodemus hears, a little, hears it a little different. <coughs> Later in the same conversation, no one has ascended, no one has gone up into heaven, except the one who descended, came down from heaven, the Son of Man. The one who comes from above, Anothen again, is above all. The one who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is above all. <coughs> so. We have above and below, anothen and earthly, and we have descent and ascent, going down and going up. So this world, this is in the world of John, this is extremely uh, characteristic for this gospel and entirely unique to it. You don't find this talk elsewhere. <coughs> More on ascent and descent. Here <coughs> we are at the, the scene of feeding the 5,000 uh, <coughs> with five loaves and two fishes and gathering up the remains. And then there is a big long aftermath on the discussion of the meaning of this and controversy that came, comes to, to be. <coughs> For I have descended from heaven 
not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I have come down, kata baino. That's a very straight word. They were saying, is not this Jesus, <coughs> the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now, now say, I have descended from heaven? Kata bebeka, <coughs> same word here. How can he say that? Well, they don't know everything. Whose father and mother we know. And they know the mother. Maybe they don't know the father. The story is assumed here. <coughs> Synoptic awareness is assumed that <coughs> Joseph is not the father. And he isn't the son of Joseph. He is the son of Mary. <coughs> and that's a different conception, different configuration. <coughs> then, and then the, uh, it ends, it, gets, it sort of gets more and more heated. <coughs> then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending, Anna by Nonta, to where he was before? What were, if you were to see him go up? He came down. What if he goes up? Can you see it? We can see it. These spatial parameters and the words and the sort of movement that is implied. <clears throat> and here is one more. This is at the do not touch me scene after the resurrection with Mary Magdalene. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended. I have not yet gone up to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending, going up <clears throat> to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So we are moving through <coughs> above and below, ascent and descent, or the other way, this descent and as uh, ascent. And here there is coming, <coughs> coming and going. And the conversation here is now the foot washing and, uh, and the conversation that happened after the foot washing. We are in the farewell territory of, of the gospel. <coughs> so Jesus is talking here, uh, or, uh, or the narrator is explaining some things first. Jesus knowing that he had come from God and was going to God, coming and going. Little children, he says <coughs> later, I am with you only a little longer. And as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. Well, we will concede that this is cryptic language. This is not straightforward. This is kind of elusive, but there is a spatial sense to it. Coming and going are spatial words <coughs> words for movement from somewhere to somewhere else. I just thought I'd give us a little breathing space <coughs> with Leonardo da Vinci again and <coughs> the Last Supper, because that is the setting of some of these <coughs> most, uh, most uh, uh, what should I say, cryptic, uh, cryptic sayings, and, <coughs> and it is a, a marvelous, marvelous uh, uh, painting. <coughs> We are now in chapter 16, but the setting is the same. And I have just left in another illustration, another painting of, uh, of the uh, farewell uh, meal. <coughs> it is not the Last Supper as such in the Gospel of John, but <coughs> that's the term we use because there are <coughs> similarities with the synoptics. Then some, so you can see that this is <coughs> a conversation that started in chapter 3. 13, continues here in chapter 16. Then some of his disciples said to one another, they're talking among themselves, what does he mean by saying to us, a little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they are discussing among themselves. And then Jesus <coughs> uh, 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 Hears it, picks up on it. <coughs> so you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. 
And then I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and I am going to the Father. So these are coming and going <coughs> things. And then there is a sense that he will be absent. But they, you will see me again. And here some people wonder whether that is, yes, they will see him again right after the resurrection. Is that it? Or is there more to it? You'll see me again, like a <coughs> at the second coming. Is that it? <coughs> Let's read more. <coughs> Here, Jesus is praying the farewell discourse or the farewell setting on Thursday night <coughs> is, ends, it, it uh, climaxes in a prayer scene where Jesus, it's often called the high priestly prayer, <coughs> John 17. And Jesus is now talking to the Father, but I, <coughs> and now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, talking to the Father. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. Strange talk. Father, this is the ending of it, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So again, there is coming and going, there are spatial parameters, but there is always, always that sense of Jesus coming to us, of the sort of indwelling, the aspiration to set up house inside human beings, as it were. And those are big, <coughs> big confounders, even though we have e e e external things. <coughs> so let's add it up here. We have above and below <coughs> in John chapter 3. We have descent and ascent in chapter 3 and chapter 6. We have coming and going all over the place, the whole gospel through. <coughs> we have seen and not seen, and seen again. You will not see me, you will see me again. We have separation and reunion, and we have an end point to be with me where I am. That's the end point. <coughs> so, the most <coughs> complicated or the, the most contested territory here in how scholars have read the Gospel of John is in chapter 5. <coughs> and I have left that for last, or almost last here, uh, chapter 5. What was the occasion there? The occasion there was the healing of the paralytic who had been ill for 38 years, and Jesus restoring him. And then <coughs> there was a big controversy. The big controversies in the Gospel started right there. So he tells those who are not uh, friendly disposed to him. Very truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Very truly I tell you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. We have read verses 24, 25, and 26. We will read three more verses in, in this, uh, <coughs> this uh, uh, passage, this paragraph. Uh, but what do we have here? We have <coughs> eternal life as present reality not only future hope. Believe in the Son of Man, you have eternal life. It is present reality. And we should read eternal life as a term for quality and not only duration, not only life after death. A quality 
that can be experienced to some extent in this life. There is no doubt that that is on the horizon here in this passage. The hour is coming and now is. The future has broken into the present. Those boundaries are kind of dissolving. Those are, that is, those are kind of strange configurations. And this has so puzzled people <coughs> and readers of the Gospel that they have coined the term realized eschatology. <coughs> Reali eschatology is, eschaton is the end, and logos is the teaching about the end. So this is about the future and, and the time of the end, as it were. Realized eschatology means that the whole story of the end has actually played, already played out in the present. And this is <coughs> many people who have contributed to that, but <coughs> leading among them is Rudolf Bultmann, who, to whom I am indebted to many insights and I am also quite sympathetic to his view of some elements of realized eschatology, <coughs> but we're not going to buy the whole, uh, the whole package. So his work on the Gospel of John, very, very important. Realized eschatology teaches that the revelation of Jesus and the experience of coming to faith in him, that's the whole thing. It isn't so interested in the world to come, afterlife, those kinds of things. Future expectations are absorbed and incorporated into the present. Passages <laughs> and Bultmann, this, he is totally reckless here, or totally sort of unapologetic here. Passages in John's Gospel that espouse traditional eschatology, the usual thing about the death, death, resurrection, second coming, going to heaven. If there are hints of that in the Gospel of John, Bultmann will say that was added by an editor. It wasn't their original. So that's a clever way of escaping that. And here is an example of that. And this is Ernst Henschen, <coughs> another great German reader of, uh, of John. I didn't bring a picture of him. But <coughs> so Ernst Henschen in his two volume, the John Commentary, commenting on John 14.2, Verse 2, I go to prepare a place, I will come again. <coughs> so he says, although the evangelist uses this figure and speaks of many mansions there, he does not want to be taken literally. Don't take that literally. Jesus restores the right relationship with God. He makes man at home with the Father. Take out the space out there. Think of it as space in here, as a sort of reconciliation. So get used to it. <coughs> the term realized eschatology has been a sort of term for the teaching of the Gospel of John, that there is a less about the future and much about the present, less about space out there, more about space in here, and Yes, realized eschatology. The end has already come. It's already over, <coughs> as it were. <coughs> so, well, uh, so that many, many scholars have <coughs> uh, uh, ascribed or subscribed to that view, but it has been corrected, and I am, uh, wish I could say even more about it, but this is Jörg Frey, who is a now living professor at uh, uh, Zurich, and a John Scholar, and I have referred to Jörg Frey's work before, he has written three books, doctoral dissertation plus, 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 three books, 600, 700 pages each, about the eschatology in the Gospel of John. And this is a remarkable thing. <coughs> and I'll say two things about it first, because some scholars say, well, John doesn't really have an eschatology. Well, <coughs> you write three books about it, there must be something to say. And the second thing about Jörg Frey's work is that he doesn't agree with Bultmann. He actually debunks Bultmann and says that, uh, that uh, there is eschatology, also traditional eschatology, and 
<laughs> this idea that you can simply, you know, get it your way by saying that some passages were added by an editor. That doesn't work anymore. <coughs> you could do that in the heyday when people, when scholars uh, <coughs> worked on texts like surgeons, but that is not any more the case. We're more respectful now. <coughs> All right, <coughs> back to uh, back to uh, John chapter 5, where we began with all those things, the no time is coming, it is now, and the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and, and they will uh, live, and so on. So now we're <coughs> continuing, and I am actually reading here verses 27, 28, and 29. Uh, <coughs> there is a little mistake there. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not <coughs> be astonished at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who practice things that are contemptible to the resurrection of judgment. And here, for this translation, I have left it with judgment. The word is krisis. And I would have liked to translate it to the resurrection of Revelation. The NRSV translates it to the resurrection of condemnation. And I would love to defend another translation, but let's say judgment. That's a neutral word, even though, as I have tried to show in an earlier presentation, in John, Revelation and judgment are almost synonymous terms. That's not the point here. The point is here is rather to show that there are Old Testament echoes in this text. There are echoes especially from the book of Daniel. And Daniel is in some ways, oh, it's all eschatology. It's all apocalyptic. It is a kind of world that seems miles and miles from the Gospel of John. But here, suddenly, there is some overlap, and let us look at some of the terms. Or let me highlight the terms we should look for, rather. Look for the word authority. Look for the word judgment. Look for the term son of man. Look for the notion of resurrection. And look for this word, contemptible, for the second resurrection. Let's now read Daniel. <coughs> First, we read from Daniel chapter 7. In my visions at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. There he is. That's the term. And that is in the New Testament a term from the book of Daniel. There is no question about it. I won't highlight all of them, but I'll put a circle around this one too. <coughs> so. He, uh, uh, son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, <coughs> glory, and sovereign power. Put judgment under that one. All nations and, every, and peoples of every language worshipped him. That's in chapter 7. We go to chapter 12. <coughs> At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of tribulation, uh, uh, such, as, uh, such as has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake resurrection, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And here we had resurrection, and we had the notion of something that is contemptible. So clearly, uh, indisputably, here, our gospel <laughs> that is said not to have much eschatology suddenly is drawing uh, on Daniel, and we are seeing the world of Daniel uh, incorporated, or uh, we are familiarized with it here. <coughs> so we'll do a retrospect, we'll add it up, <coughs> we just need to do a few more things here. 
the now of the future is <coughs> one more thing. This is at the raising of Lazarus. So here Jesus is coming four days after Lazarus died. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And so here we have the future already felt in the present. And the Gospel of John will do that and will in some ways transform hope to certainty. That seems to me to be clear. And then there is tribulation, even in the Gospel of John. Even in John, there is that horizon of tribulation and anguish. And, and let's read that. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. <clears throat> do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. I have said these things to you to keep you from stumbling. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, an hour is coming when those who kill you will think that, they are do that by doing so they are offering worship to God. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face tribulation. But take courage. I have conquered the world. And here we're back with Daniel one more time. There shall be a time of tribulation, such as has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. The word tribulation in here, slipsis, and the word tribulation here in the Septuagint is also slipsis. These are overlapping horizons. This horizon is not absent in the Gospel of John. <coughs> so here I try to make some illustrations here to conclude. So here we go from the present to the future. And there is a future, there is a space out there, a sort of timeline. And the Gospel of John is not totally absent in that sort of timeline. but. There is also this <coughs> possibility or this reality that some things that we think belong in the future, there is sort of like the arrow puts it back and it puts, you know, the, what happens in the present is projected bigger than what happens in the future. Something has come into the world. It is really, really big. And the Gospel of John doesn't want to say, well, it's all there, it's all in the future, one of those days it will happen. That's what Martha thinks. I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus puts it back into the present. So we have one more thing then. We have <coughs> then the future, the future now sort of asserting itself in the present. It's quite amazing. I think my three arrows are all relevant, all representative, but of course <coughs> those two arrows are the, more, uh, the, the least expected. I have one more illustration, <coughs> this one I have made in relation to, I had someone make it for me, in relation to uh, the book of Revelation. And I have put John there as though, as though there is a John in the Gospel and a John in Revelation. There surely is one in Revelation. <coughs> The notion of coming and going here, the sort of spatial parameters. Story that begins in heaven, there is the incarnation and Jesus appears on earth. He returns to heaven, he comes back to earth at the second coming, <coughs> and then he takes believers to heaven. That is traditional eschatology, that is the Christian story, <coughs> and then According to the John of Revelation, he comes back to earth. Everyone comes back to earth. It's all on earth in the end. <coughs> and I thought I should show the proof of that <coughs> and then also show proof that maybe John in the Gospel already thinks that way. That's the strange thing. So let's read Revelation first here. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals, human beings. He will dwell with them. And here there is no doubt that we are on earth. He will dwell with them on earth. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them where they are on earth. And here is the fourth gospel. We read it already. We'll read it again. Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. It is as similar to Revelation as can be. In Revelation, perhaps as the only book in the New Testament, the life to come will be an earthly life. As the only book in the New Testament, except perhaps for the Gospel of John, if you read this text with an eye to the text in Revelation. Look them up, Revelation 21, 3, and the Gospel of John 14, 23. <coughs> One more thing, <clears throat> there is a kind of interim period to show that spiritually speaking, the present here is not no man's land for the believer. There was a time when God was present in the world through Jesus. There is a time when he will be manifestly present in the world again in the future. And we are now living in a sort of interim, a kind of no man's land. But Jesus has made provision for that too. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. These are things to be experienced in the present. The sense of not being orphaned. The sense that he came. And that we do see him by means of the presence of God through the comforter, the advocate, the one who is representing God in the world as we speak. <clears throat> Let's do our retrospective. Eschatology in the Gospel of John. Uh, I go to prepare a place. When the fourth gospel, <coughs> fourth gospel, I'm sorry, speaks about the future, there are double meanings. Temporal stereoscope and telescoping. Temporal stereoscope will see, means that you look through a, through a, 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 a microscope and you see two horizons at the same time. You should just see one scene, but you see two. And the telescoping means that events that are separate in, in, in time, they seem to contract and overlap and happen almost at the same time. <clears throat> Word pairs such as above, below, descent, ascent, coming, going, see or not see, separation and reunion, they have a literal as well as symbolic meaning. That's a big one. And <clears throat> the conflation of present and future transforms hope into certainty in this book, in chapter 5 and chapter 11 especially. The advocate <clears throat> sent from the Father is the assurance of presence in absence. I will not leave you orphaned. And <coughs> traditional eschatology is not absent in the fourth gospel. In the world, you will have tribulation. That is very much the case <coughs> in, uh, in uh, the synoptics. <coughs> and then <coughs> there is departure and separation on the horizon. But the greeting is a certain Auf Wiedersehen and not an uncertain goodbye. So you have pain now, says the revealer. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you.